This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 9 Obviously, in the present state of mankind, when the vast majority of people, oppressed by poverty and stupefied by superstition, stagnate in a state of humiliation, the fate of humanity depends on the action of a relatively small number of individuals. Obviously, it will not be possible suddenly to get people to raise themselves to the point where they can feel the duty, indeed, uh, the pleasure from controlling their own actions in such a way that others will derive the maximum benefit therefrom. But if today the thinking and directing forces in society are few, it is not a reason for paralyzing yet more of them and of subjecting many others to a few of them. It is not a reason for organizing society in such a way that, thanks to the apathy of that, is the result of secured positions, thanks to birth, patronage, esprit de corps, and all government machinery, that the most lively forces and real ability end up by finding themselves outside the government and almost without influence on social life, and those that attain to government find themselves out of their environment and being above all interested in remaining in power, lose all possibilities of acting and only serve as an obstacle to others. Once this negative power that is government is abolished, society will be what it can be, but all it can be, given the forces and abilities available at the time, if there are educated people who wish to spread knowledge, they will organize the schools and make a special effort to persuade everybody of the usefulness and pleasure to be got from an education. And if there are no such people or only a few, a government cannot create them. All it would all it would do all it could do would be what happens now. Take the few that there are away from their rewarding work and set them to drafting regulations would have to be imposed with policemen and make intelligent and devoted teachers into political beings that is useless parasites all concerned with imposing their whims and with their ma- imposing their whims and with maintaining themselves in power. If there are doctors and experts in public health, they will organize health service and if there are were none, the government could not create them. All it could do would be to cast doubts on the abilities of the existing doctors with a public justifiably suspicious of all that is imposed from above would seize upon to get rid of them. If there are engineers, engine drivers, and so on, they will organize the railways. And if there were none, once again, a government could not create them. The revolution, by abolishing government and private property, will not create forces that do not exist, but it will leave the way open for the development of all available forces and talents, will destroy every class with an interest in keeping the masses in a state of brutishness, and will ensure that everyone be able to act and to influence according to his abilities, his enthusiasm, and his interests. And this is the only way that the masses can raise themselves, for it is only through freedom that one educates oneself to be free. Just as it is only by working that one can learn to work. A government, assuming it had no other advantages, would always have that of accustoming the governed to timidity and of tending to become always more oppressive and of making itself ever more necessary. Besides, if one wants a government which has to educate the masses and put them on the road to anarchy, one must also indicate what will be the background and the way of forming this government. Will it be the dictatorship of the best people? But who are the best? And who will recognize these qualities in them? The majority is generally attached to established prejudices and has ideas and attitudes which have already been superseded by a better endowed minority. But among the thousand minorities, all of which believe themselves to be right and all and can all be right on some issues, by whom and with what criterion will the choice be made to put the social forces at the disposal of one of them when only the future can decide between the parties in conflict? If you take a hundred intelligent supporters of, a di- of dictatorship, you will discover that each one of them believes that he should be, if not the dictator himself, one of them, and at least very close to the dictatorship. So dictators would be those who, pursuing one course or another, succeed in, in- imposing themselves and in in the present political climate, one can safely say that all their efforts would be employed in the struggle to defend themselves against the attacks of their enemies, conveniently forgetting 
any vague intentions of social education, assuming that they ever had any such intentions? Will it be instead a government elected by universal suffrage suffrage, and thus the more or less sincere expression of the wishes of the majority? But if you consider these worthy electors as unable to look after their own interests themselves, how is it that they will know how to choose for themselves the shepherds who must guide them? And how will they be able to solve this problem of social alchemy, of producing the election of a genius from the votes of a mass of fools? And what will happen to the minorities, which are still the most intelligent, most active and radical part of society? In order to solve the social problem for the benefit of everyone, there is only one means to crush those who own social wealth by revolutionary action and put everything at the disposal of everybody and leave all the forces, the ability and the good, all of the goodwill that exists among the people free to act and to provide for the needs of all. We struggle for anarchy and for socialism because we believe that anarchy and socialism must be realized immediately. That is to say that in the revolutionary act, we must drive government away, abolish pro- property and entrust public service, which in this co- context will include all social life to the spontaneous, free, not official, not authorized efforts of all interested parties and of all willing helpers. Of course, there will be difficulties and drawbacks, but they will be resolved, and they will only be resolved in an anarchist way, by means, that is, of direct intervention of the interested parties and by free agreements. We do not know whether anarchy and socialism will triumph when the next revolution takes place, but there is no doubt that if the so-called programs of compromise triumph, it will be because on this occasion we have been defeated and never because we believed it useful to leave standing any part of the evil system under which mankind groans. In any case, we will have on events the kind of influence which will reflect our numerical strength, our energy, our intelligence, and our intransigence. Even if we are defeated, our work will not have been useless, for the greater our resolve to achieve the implementation of our program in full, the less property and less government there will be in the new society, and we will have performed a worthy task for, after all, human progress is measured by the extent government power and private property are reduced. If today we fall without compromising, we can be sure of victory tomorrow. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.